Hi, everybody. Uh, today we have our fifth uh, Friday forecasting talk organized by Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting. And today we will have presentations by Robert Fields and Mike Gilliland. And uh, they both will be discussing the question of forecast value added. First, Robert will, oh, first, uh, sorry, Mike will give a short uh, presentation summarizing the, the main ideas behind that and then we will move to move to Robert uh, with his presentation but before we do that I wanted to say a couple of words about uh, the center and our events uh, first uh, you can see on this slide what the center does there's a variety of different projects we do some consultancy master summer projects and so on and we work in different areas, including supply chain forecasting, machine learning, uh, and uh, in different areas like fast moving consumer goods, government, pharma, a bit of NHS, and so on. So if you are interested in collaborating with us, please send us a message using either email or any of our uh, social media. Uh, just to give you an idea what we have, uh, how we present in the web. We have landing page for these events. And you can see the future ones. We will have six events in 2020. This is uh, the fifth. And then we will have more in the 2021. So stay tuned. We have our YouTube channel. Just uh, search for Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting and you will find the channel. We have our website, Twitter, LinkedIn and so on. So we, you have plenty of ways to get in touch with us. Please don't hesitate to do so if you're interested. Uh, that's it. That's a short presentation from my side. Um, I think we can start with a presentation from Robert. Oh, from Mike, oh. sorry, from Mike. Hey, welcome everyone. And uh, yes, I'm going to give a brief introduction to Robert's presentation with some background and motivation for forecast value added analysis, starting with the observation that forecasting is a huge waste of management time. Now, this doesn't mean that forecasting is pointless and irrelevant. It doesn't mean that forecasting isn't useful and necessary to run our organizations. <clears throat> it just means simply that the amount of time and effort and resources spent on forecasting is not commensurate with the benefit achieved. We spend far too many resources generating, reviewing, adjusting, and approving our forecast, while almost invariably failing to achieve the level of accuracy desired. So my argument is that the conversation and the focus need to change, to change from esoteric model building to the forecasting process itself, its efficiency and its effectiveness. In short, perhaps the best way to get better forecasts is to stop making them worse. Something Steve Morlidge has, has referred to as avoiding the avoidable error. And that's what FVA is all about. So let's take a look at a typical business forecasting process. Here your data is fed into software that generates what we refer to as the statistical forecast. It then gets reviewed and overridden by a demand planner or forecast analyst before feeding into a more elaborate collaborative or consensus process and then ultimately in many organizations, a final review step by executive management where they can make further overrides. Now, this typical process consumes obviously large amounts of management time and company resources. But we know that business forecasting can be a highly politicized process where participants inflict their biases and personal agendas on the computer generated number, especially if what the computer says is not what they wanna see. So I'm going to suggest that the important question is not what accuracy did our process achieve, but rather is the process adding value? Are we making the forecasts more accurate and less biased by all our efforts? How would we ever know? Well, the common traditional metrics like MAD and MAPE themselves, by themselves, do not answer that question. Steve Morlidge has a nice quote here that forecasting performance can be quickly improved if you know where to look but that the conventional metrics like MAPE shed little light on the issue. So sure, these common metrics tell you the size of your error, but by themselves don't tell you how efficiently you are at achieving the accuracy that you reach 
or whether you're forecasting any better than some cheap alternative method. These are the sorts of things that FEA aims to find out. So FEA is defined as the change in a forecasting performance metric. Whatever metric you happen to be using, it's the change in that metric that can be attributed to a particular step or participant in the forecasting process. It's measured by comparing the results of a process activity to the results you would have achieved without doing that activity. So FEA can be positive or negative. Now you can think of FEA analysis as the application of basic or traditional scientific methods to forecasting. You start with a null hypothesis that your forecasting process has no effect. You then measure the results of steps in the process and try to determine whether you can reject that null hypothesis and thereby conclude that there is an, there is an effect, either good or bad. Now, there's a nice analogy here to testing a new drug for its safety and effectiveness uh, by, by comparing it to a control group taking a placebo. We're doing a similar thing with FEA analysis with the naive forecast serving as the placebo. So let's look at a very simple forecasting process. Here the data goes into the software, generates the statistical forecast, which then can be reviewed and overridden, about as basic as you can go. In FEA analysis, you compare the analyst override to the statistical forecast, but then compare both to what the naive forecast would have generated, the naive serving as the placebo. Here's an example of a very basic style of FEA report known as the stair step report. This example was, was uh, shown by a couple of gentlemen from Newell Rubbermaid back in 2011. Across their entire product line, this is thousands of products, overall they achieved using a, a naive forecast. The forecast accuracy would have been about 60%. However, with their forecasting software, across their full product line, they achieve forecast accuracy of 65%, which as you see in the third column, is a five percentage points of value added by the statistical forecast. However, the final forecast, or all, after all the adjustments that have been made by management, was only 62% accurate. So all their time and effort they spent on forecasting had the net result looking at that lower right-hand corner there of reducing forecast accuracy by three percentage points. This is not an uncommon finding. This is the thing we're trying to identify and avoid with FEA analysis. So um, Paul Goodwin in his book, Profit from Your Forecasting Software, has a nice little section on FEA, including just some warnings and in interpreting the results. You know, you need to be cautious in doing this. You, you can't draw conclusions from insufficient data and insufficient evidence. Obviously, if you just have a limited uh, number of data points, the observed res results may be due strictly to chance. So you can't jump to conclusions. Also, Robert in, in his writings has, has made a very important point that there can be variation in the FEA results depending on what particular metric you're using as part of the FEA analysis. So just be aware of that. And finally, as it is in most cases, graphical representation of the data can be very helpful. So to wrap up before handing off to Robert, uh, why do we use FEA? Well, what we wanna do is identify those non-value adding steps and activities from the forecasting process so we can eliminate them, streamline the forecasting process, direct resources to more productive activities in the organization, and ultimately achieve better forecast because if you can eliminate, identify and eliminate those activities that are just making the forecast worse, you can ultimately get better forecasts for free. With that, Robert, if you want to take over control and we can look at the latest research on this topic. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. So Robert will now share his uh, slides and we will send him live. I, hopefully you can hear me. I've got a slightly different aim in this presentation. Mike has given an excellent uh, skeleton of what FVA, FVA forecast value added is about. I've been re-looking at some of the evidence and raising some questions and I want to share with you uh, the uh, what I've found. I've not actually completed the work, but we are starting to find some interesting facts. And uh, this quotation uh, from O. Henry, a uh, uh, Henry short story by way of Kendall Stewart and Ord, the famous statistical 
uh, background, explains what I'm up to. I really am trying to take the various studies, and there aren't that many of them that have been published. There's lots of semi-anecdotes uh, about when forecast value added adds value and when it does, when it actually diminishes the value, but actually we want to look at large amounts of data. So that's the aim, uh, that's the outline. Um, I'm going to raise one or two questions. Why is it still practically important? Uh, then uh, present some of the evidence. Uh, getting to the core question, does forecast value added? Uh, is it positive usually? Do we, do we actually gain from these various processes? And finally, uh, for discussion with Mike, can we manage the process to deliver improvements? And that's where we get uh, really quite speculative. I know of companies, and I'm sure Mike does as well, that are trying to, but many companies don't focus at all on FVA. So just to put the process in the somewhat of the same context, we've got the demand planner in the middle of uh, data, one way or another, getting some uh, information from marketing, sales, logistics through an SNOP process, um, a forecasting system which delivers forecasts. Let's envisage two alternatives and some such as SAP, uh, parts of the SAP system will give you a choice of different forecasting methods to produce a statistical forecast. The demand planner then one way or another through the process produces a final forecast. So we've got a statistical forecast, we've got information, and uh, we've got uh, our job then is to incorporate that information one way or another uh, to produce a final forecast where judgment is a key component of the integration. So what is forecast value added? Uh, again, I repeat a little from a slightly different perspective uh, of the details that Mike gave. But the idea, we've got one method, B, and we want to compare it with method A, and then add, ask the question, does method B add anything at all? Um, in fact, as I'll sh show in the next slide, most companies, one way or another, use judgmental expert or judgment through often a very complicated process to support their operations and modify their statistical forecast. So there we've got a simple, a reasonably simple statistical forecast. Uh, exponential smoothing, but we've got a variable X, which I'm going to come back to X. It might be a promotion, for example. It could be a holiday variable. It could be back to school. And then we have a degree of magic. Somebody one way or another trying to add something to that uh, uh, statistical method. So that's the essence of it. And in fact, if we take survey evidence, um, we can find that actually the statistical methods adjusted is the most common method of forecasting. And I know of no surveys that have produced contrary uh, contrary results. So that's an average of a, a whole set of studies over a number of years. And I'm not sure, interesting question, whether it's getting any less, but I'll leave that aside. So what do we actually know about forecast value added? First, the point I've just made, more, most organizations actually do it. Uh, so let's define a final forecast, FFC, and we're going to compare it to a statistical forecast. The other thing we sort of know is many interventions fail to add value. There are um, three major published studies on this, uh, one of which is my own with Paul Goodwin uh, and uh, others, Costas uh, Nicolopoulos and Michael Lawrence. Another is by uh, Philip Hans Francis uh, with many thousands of data points, as did ours, and a more recent one. Uh, with a number of authors of whom Shari de Betz uh, continues to work in the area. So, you have a statistical forecast, we get some information. That information could be positive or when adjustments will be made uh, upward and the final forecast will be bigger than the statistical forecast or alternatively negative. We know that on average, 
positive adjustments are damaging from these studies we've seen, that negative adjustments add value. And I'm going to come back to that. Maybe there's a bit, some question marks about that. But certainly we, we've been confident from these studies which started uh, in, uh, well, uh, my own study was with Paul, was uh, published in 2009. There were some early studies around about 1990, but they approached the problem in a rather different way. So leaving those aside, we found negative adjustments and positive adjustments, breaking them up, looking at them separately. They had quite separate characteristics. We also found, unsurprisingly, small adjustments do not have much effect. I mean, by definition, a small adjustment can't affect uh, accuracy. And also, this is from a, a, a study of the forecasting process, uh, experimental studies, that extraneous information may well, not inevitably, detract from value. And there's an awful lot going on in that forecasting process that Mike and I have just described. But, and this final point at the bottom of the slide is important, analysis has been inconsistent. There's no clear picture. Um, typical adjustments, about 70 to 90% of companies in manufacturing, retailing, even retailing where you've got uh, potentially, certainly tens of thousands of SKUs, perhaps many more than that. Uh, adjustment is less common, but you can make adjustments across the board, for example, and that leads to uh, them being quite common in retailing. There are, interestingly, they're also common in other domains. Macroeconomic forecasters, when faced with COVID, or uh, the U UK, of course, has both COVID and Brexit to uh, contemplate. So we make judgmental adjustments. They're time consuming, Mike's strong point there, and the evidence on effectiveness, and there's the citations, uh, is actually mixed. And crucially, we don't know how or what makes expert adjustments effective. I mean, it seems bizarre, doesn't it, that you go through a, a long process with groups of people who know a lot about the, the subject matter, about promotions and marketing for the company, or alternatively macroeconomic forecasting, and actually finish up making damaging assumptions. But we do have some spe uh, speculative hypotheses. Mike mentioned measuring. Me measuring forecast value added is actually quite important. There's a reference there, and probably the best reference, uh, that's the that's the research paper, Davidenko and Files. There's a more accessible paper published in uh, Mike's interesting book on business forecasting. Uh, so you do have to think about it. MAP, so often used, is, is subject to all sorts of problems. So if you're comparing MAP from one method with MAP from another method, you'll get typically an inappropriate answer. So we've suggested uh, the Average error, absolute error for method B taken over a data set compared with the mean absolute error from method A. That percentage is really quite important. Um, error, some further definitions. You can actually do it in a simpler fashion. For each adjustment you make, you can look at the error from method B compared with the error from method A, take the absolute value, take that ratio, and then summarize the ratios. So I've done both in this evidence I've presented, but there's not much difference. Just a point, it's always a mistake to average percentages. Uh, you have to average percentages by taking a geometric mean. We're not used to it, but it's dead easy to do. You just take logs. And finally, at the bottom of the slide, I point out that bias is important. So it's no good improving the accuracy of, of, by your adjustment process if one way or another you're uh, decreasing uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, increasing the bias. So we look at the bias that you get from the adjustment process as well as the uh, accuracy measures from these ratios. So that's the, that's the plan of action and that's about as technical as I get. It's worthwhile asking the question, why do most organizations use it? Well, uh, Mike's highlighted, it fits with the organizational process. People need to, in different bits of their organization, need to act, 
accept the forecast. They wish to put information from various sources into the forecast. Uh, there are planning issues and targets which may affect dangerous area, but may affect the forecasting as well. Another point is that statistical models seem inadequate. And we use an example in a paper that Paul and I are uh, uh, published or are publishing in the International Journal of Forecasting, where essentially the people forecasting regarded the sales as part, uh, part of a product life cycle. So there we've got a product life cycle. Uh, now they used an exponential smoothing algorithm, uh, but they modified the exponential smoothing because obviously an exponential smoothing uh, method can never produce, and there you see uh, some forecasts from it, never produce a product life cycle. So the statistical model seems inadequate. Alternatively, the statistical model is inadequate because it doesn't include unique events such as promotions, and promotions turn out to be the major reason that people actually uh, modify the forecast along with holidays. So where's the evidence? Here are the databases. I'm going to add some others. I am uh, spent a bit of the, this morning discovering my bad computer programming. Um, but slowly making progress. The aim is a consistent analysis of all available data sets. So we get some clear feel. One of the issues with adjustments is outliers uh, affect the numbers really quite badly. Just to give you an example, which I'll, I'll probably come back to very briefly later, but um, in one of the companies we looked at, the, uh, the forecasters would every so often set the, their forecasts to zero. So they got a statistical forecast, a non-zero statistical forecast, and they set it to zero. It gives a very uh, typically a large 100% adjustment, negative adjustment. I've already said that negative adjustments work well, but they don't for this company when you set them to zero. Those were terrible forecasts. So those are outliers that one way or another can quite distort your analysis. So we actually want to uh, get a consistent analysis across companies so we can find some uh, findings that actually make a lot of sense and are robust. Now, prior hypothesis from the earlier work, negative information, downward adjustment proved to be effective. And why? No constraints on supply, so you can't sell the stuff you don't have. Notice the comment about a maximum of 100%. The size of the adjustment signals the expert's confidence in the information. You would therefore expect larger adjustments to have more positive forecast value. And the practical questions, can the series and processes where FBA is positive be predicted? Can we, can we understand which skews we can actually add value to? When should the adjustments be made? And can the adjustment in terms of its size uh, be made to work to good effect? And finally, and related to this, if we're going to propose changes to the adjustment process in an organization, can they be implemented? So, does adjustments add value? Here are the three data sets I've got to. Uh, you see the number of SKUs, a lot of SKUs, uh, some 80,000 or so observations in total. Uh, we've, I've got two measures of forecast value added, uh, which I've described to you, and bias. Now, the first thing that strikes, hopefully it strikes you, but certainly struck me, was actually data set two, which is Philip Hans Francis's data set, um, I don't know what, uh, it's one company across a whole series of uh, product groups and a whole series of, of regions. Uh, a lot of adjustment, 97% adjustment, and it's terrible. Uh, the third data set uh, actually is quite interesting because you get very disparate results. One of the smaller bits of that data, it's got 45,000 observations in total, but only 3,560 of this particular company. We find actually they adjust everything, 
they, they do a fantastic job of diminishing bias and uh, uh, add substantial value. Well, why might that be? Why might that be? So, mixed results. Let's break that down into information. And we find, I'm just, you've got the data and you'll be able to pick up on this. Hopefully at some stage in the next millennia, we'll uh, actually publish some of this. But we actually find, uh, first, there are more positive than negative adjustments. And that bias is usually improved by adjustment and that negative adjustments are more beneficial. But actually, it turns out that uh, positive adjustments are beneficial, just not very beneficial. Um, the improvements are not substantial. And for data set two, uh, they ba barely matter at all. So that's the, uh, the position. We've come out of that analysis knowing something we didn't previously know, that forecast uh, value added, the adjustment process is usually positive. Now, what about the size of the adjustments? Um, well, um, how do you measure size? Well, that's controversial. And the, uh, for those of you who are foresight readers, you'll find an interesting article coming out uh, that Mike and I comment on, on by Baker. Uh, he argues that you shouldn't measure it as the final forecast over the systems forecast. I'm personally not convinced. That's the intuitive way that a forecaster will understand how big a forecast they're making. But it also is true that the variation in the underlying series is potentially important. So if we break this down into adjustment classes with positive and negative, we've learned that we really do have to uh, break it down into these uh, three classes. We get, uh, and that's just some evidence from one of the uh, data sets, we get that uh, there are no side of size effects, but for the largest um, adjustments. So the size effects are sort of there with positive and they're consistently there with negative. Uh, for the very largest 100% adjustments, you'll notice uh, those were always uh, negative. They always had a, a damaging effect, which is if you think about it, it's really surprising. What on earth was going on there? I don't know whether Mike's got any views, but I, I really don't know. They, sh they should be getting that right. They should be getting that right, these experts. But, and this is very much, as the slide says, work in progress. I think this is where I discovered a, a programming error, but don't, don't, don't be too disturbed by this. These are, this is a, an interesting uh, speculation. Um, that when you look at the uh, forecast value added by the size effects, negative adjustments, positive adjustments separated out, one is where, and I, I should uh, remind you of the interpretation of the statistic, uh, uh, above one is uh, negative, that is to say you're damaging the statistical forecast below one is positive. So 1.5, the value up here, you're getting a 50% uh, improve, 50% uh, uh, damage. 0.5, got a 50% improvement. And you see uh, for negative, as you move the size of the adjustment down, you get really quite large improvements there. Uh, whilst here, they're a bit all over the place, but actually you know, these two points, Two classes are not too bad uh, in terms of their the the line across there in a, a box plot is the median, but you also see uh, very long tails. The problem, perhaps, is too many poor positive adjustments. So, question, and that that comes to the management of the process. So, what goes wrong? Well, one possibility is optimism bias. What is optimism bias? But so when the final forecast is is larger than the actual um, over adjustment, maybe where you uh, are under adjustment uh, for positive, the final is greater than the actual For negative. The final is less than the actual. So there's some overlap between optimism uh, bias uh, and uh, over adjustment. So uh, optimism bias and over adjustment is the same for positive information. For example, other 
uh, features. The failure to account for consistent errors in the system forecast. A lot of systems still in operation. Uh, obviously, we, we exempt SAS from this uh, criticism, Mike, but a lot of systems are really pretty simple. Exponential smoothing or extensions of exponential smoothing. They won't typically take into account any complex dynamics in the process. Uh, they, nor will they uh, necessarily, and of course this leads to why people modify uh, forecasts, statistical forecasts in the first place, they won't necessarily um, uh, take into account any promotions or they are in a particular way or Christmas and certainly they won't take into account COVID. So a, there may be a misweighting of the system forecast and a corresponding overweighting of the experts. People like their own judgments. There's lots of evidence about that. Nice speculation, which uh, Fortius Petropolis uh, uh, produced, which was that people compensate from previous errors. So they made a mistake in making an adjustment in the last period. They then make a, an equal, almost equally big mistake in the next period. And finally, leading to the uh, these overly simple uh, models, a misweighting of events. They don't take into account things like uh, promotions. Uh, and promotions, of course, come in a lot of shapes and sizes. What about optimism? Well, I need to move relatively quickly on. As I said, it occurs when the file is greater than the actual. Uh, uh, and when adjustments are, oh, I'm sorry, let's get back there. Does optimism improve or damage forecast value added? So we've calculated these statistics. And the conclusion, is, which is robust, it turns out, over uh, data sets, is that optimism is damaging for upward adjustments. The negative adjustments beneficial. Uh, so we need to essentially, because you're giving more attention to the systems forecast, you're, um, you're not, uh, you're, you're upgrading the systems forecast with a, when the information is negative. So optimism then, a mixed picture, it's not consistently negative. What about over adjustment? Uh, over adjustment, uh, up or down leads to damage. Um, I also here give fi figures. We find that uh, over adjusting is plus one. We sound the negative information, 33% uh, for positive information at 66%. So we find differential behavior with both uh, optimism and over adjustment. So coming to conclusion, what we uh, I, I, the title of the talk uh, was what we should know about forecast value added. I've really talked about what we do know about forecast value added. What we've learned from this evaluate, uh, evaluation is that there are characteristic biases that lead to poor or negative forecast value added. Size, direction, optimism, adjustments. Um, for many companies, expert adjustment has more potential uh, than improved statistical forecasts. Some of the gains, the figures that I've shown you, are really very substantial, uh, exciting. Um, now, there are a number of possible explanations about this. Uh, one explanation is that statistical methods are very poor. We'll come to that in the uh, discussion. But there is where you've got a poor statistical method, there's a lots of possible forecast value added. But we need to understand the skew level characteristics and, and processes that deliver it. Uh, what levers we can exert to guide people. There aren't very many ways of uh, changing uh, forecasters' behavior. We, want, we can guide them, we can make recommendations, or we can restrict them insofar as we've been able to test out uh, restricting people to make adjustments is potentially uh, dangerous. I mean, first it demotivates. Alternatively, it leads to game playing where uh, somebody who's restricted to make uh, all adjustments have to be greater than 20% or greater than 50%. They were going to make a 20% uh, adjustment, but they'll one way or another modify it. So, uh, and so that they get the number that they first thought of. So how can recommendations 
be implemented? That's the, the core question. And we really don't understand very much. So what's the takeaways? This has been, uh, in a sense, a bit of an academic talk. In that I've given some, I uh, hopefully, clear information of where you can get gains. Um, but there's still a long way to go. The first obvious point, picking up on the notion that forecast value added analysis often wastes time, is focused only on important products where there's plenty of improvement, plenty of room for improvement, where the statistical forecast errors are typically large. Monitor forecast value added. I don't think in my travels I've come over more than a small number of companies which monitor their forecast value added analysis, given that almost all companies actually do it. Uh, and you want to modif <coughs> monitor by category, by SKU, by region. We did some early analysis uh, with a, um, a retailer and we found, oh, I'm sorry, not a, well, it was a manufacturer. And we found that what really affected and their accuracy performance and their forecast value added was who they were selling into. Some companies were very hard to sell into. It meant that forecasts were inaccurate, that expert knowledge was hard to come by. Other companies were much more straightforward. So you do need to do that, that uh, uh, subdivision analysis. And in fact, I've seen some um, examples uh, <laughs> Uh, some examples of where that's implemented in some very attractive computer software. But this is a rare uh, situation. And finally, store event data to link to error. We need to know wh what we're not understanding. Uh, the companies may be managing some of the first three. Some companies are already managing. And the final point is about machine learning. Machine learning is sometimes uh, recommended by consultants as a way of eliminating the demand planner. Some of you are probably demand planners in the audience, and I doubt that you particularly wish to be eliminated uh, by machine learning or any other method. But I don't think we need to worry about it because uh, of the complexities. And think about the COVID crisis. One way or another, there's plenty of information that experts should know and guiding them to make uh, suitable adjustments is the, the next task for researchers and software designers and, and consultants. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, so we have several questions and I will use my power as a producer of this event to first ask a question, question by Sven because I think it's more related to your uh, presentation mainly. And then we will move to other questions. Sven's uh, question is, well, he's saying that it wasn't fully clear if the F FVE that you presented for the three data sets was estimated from naive to judgment or stats to judgment. So maybe you can clarify that. Uh, yes, uh, stats to judgment. It was their statistical methods. Um, one of the data sets, unfortunately, I can't actually get to the naive forecast. Uh, the uh, last data point was lost. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, right, so we have uh, other questions. First, uh, Nicholas van der Poot is asking, he's saying that he usually advises practitioners to edit forecasts only when they have uh, some piece of information that is not taken by the model into account. And he gives an example with price. So if we know that price will change, uh, then you might want to introduce some changes. And the question, would you have any other best practices to share? Well, let's first uh, hear what Mike has to say and then uh, go to Robert. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think we definitely see way more adjustments to forecast that needs to be done. The first definite piece of advice is small adjustments, completely waste of time, even if they're correct. They're going to make such a small difference. They're probably not going to change any decisions or actions being taken by the organization. So just don't even do those. And, and the other point Robert brought up was focus. If you are uh, going to make adjustment, focus on you know important items where it's where it's worth your time 
where there is an opportunity because of say bad forecast, statistical forecast error, where there is an opportunity to actually make a difference with your adjustment. So those would be a couple things just off the top. Thanks, uh, Robert. Yep. I'll, I'll pass on that. <laughs> okay, I guess nothing else to add to that one. Uh, the second question is also by Nicholas. He says that we could easily imagine uh, using machine learning to flag items to be reviewed by demand planners based on historical performance. Um, and uh, do you have any experience with such a concept? So I guess the idea is if the demand planner doesn't do a good job, uh, we could somehow address this using machine learning. Yeah, there's at least three machine learning approaches I'm familiar with that are designed to, I'd say, augment the role of the demand planner and guide them in making the overrides. Um, one from the, the serial company Kellogg's along with uh, partner consulting partner First Analytics and uh, an independent but very similar approach taken in, in SAS R&D a couple of years ago. They first spoke about these where they attempt to identify uh, where, which overrides or which forecasts you should make an adjustment along with suggesting a direction and a range of you know, where the kind of a lower and higher range of where you should make an adjustment. And the most recent one, which uh, Robert brought up from Jeff Baker, he currently works for company Chainalytics, using a machine learning uh, with a classification tree based on various characteristics to tell you whether or not you should make such an override. Okay, uh, Robert, do you have anything? Well, th this is a key question and, and Mike has referred to two uh, positive examples, but in general, the issue of constraining the uh, SNOP process to produce or the demand planner, if the demand planner is the final person, the person finally responsible is, I would say, pretty hard to do. Uh, the the uh, HCI. <laughs> Sorry, we've joined with the dog here. The HCI literature uh, has talked about restrictiveness, as I mentioned, and guidance. Um, and uh, guidance is typically downplayed. They, they, people don't listen too much to the uh, guidance they get. So that th this is the research challenge, and it also translates into software. So you uh, offer some guidance, and, and possibly this. Uh, relates also to the previous question. You offer some guidance. We think the price effects are going to be a certain amount. You've, uh, we know the model doesn't include price. Uh, how are you going to modify it? And uh, so I think the answer is we don't know. There are one or two examples. It's up uh, the research community really needs to understand more about them. We can do some of the work experimentally uh, to actually um, help us with that. The linking to the machine learning comment, obviously machine learning has the potential, well, I mean, there's statistical methods have the potential to include factors such as price promotions, include moving holidays and, and so on. Uh, the design of robust methods for doing it is an open question, and there will be still uh, questions about whether Promotion A is the same as the hist history of promotion uh, B, C and D and so on. So with the retailer we've worked with, they have 10, initially they wanted 40 incidentally, 10 promotional categories. And then we get a new promotion. It doesn't fall naturally into these uh, categories. So the point I made about storing event information I think is really quite critical. Uh, Paul and I have speculated, others have speculated also, that that inv event information is going to be very important. Uh, and we've done some analysis uh, of event information which is not included in the, in the models. But as yet, I've not seen that taken into account. OK, thanks. Um... The next question by Ioannis Lafinos M5 has used RMSE, RMSSE and Pinball to measure the performance of forecasting methods. 
What do you think about them? Are they better than the existing error measures? I don't know who wants to take this first. Robert? Robert, Robert yeah, this yeah, is you. I, I'm not going to spend. Well, the, um, the, the relative mean square error performance, I don't, I don't think is a particularly a root, relative root mean square error performance, I don't think is a particularly good measure. Uh, I don't think it's particularly intuitive. It's not, for it's not particularly robust. But you know, um, the analysis I presented is being concerned with the sorts of data that are available in the company. Um, if the measures are um, used across a fairly well-behaved data set, it probably doesn't much matter. But the advantage of using for uh, the uh, the ratio, uh, the relative uh, absolute error uh, measure, for example, is relatively its robustness. So, uh, um, yeah, I mean, these do matter. They, they, these do matter. In fact, the Davidenko and Fars paper actually demonstrates where you can come to the wrong conclusion about forecast value added. Uh, and that's uh, potentially really quite important when you actually try to do the sorts of analysis that Mike was describing of breaking down the whole process into where uh, value does get added. OK, thanks. Uh, we have a question from John Boylan, and I think that Mike would be uh, first person to <laughs> respond to this. Uh, should FVA be FAA? So forecast accuracy added. Should there be a complementary measure showing the financial effects of different stages in the forecasting process? Uh, ultimately, that's what you're trying to do is improve the, the, the performance of the company overall. That's just a difficult adding a putting a dollar value to any of this stuff. I just find is a very difficult problem. Uh, to get a precise, a non-ambiguous answer to these things. So I think it would be great if, if someone could advance the FBA idea into that and actually dollarize the value of these adjustments. I think that's just beyond my skill set for sure. Mm -hmm. Robert? You could, you could at least um, measure some of the time that's spent. Uh, the case study that uh, we're publishing in the International Journal of Forecasting, uh, the uh, I think each month the company had something like 40 meetings uh, with, uh, you know, a number of people. I mean, it was a large number. I may be uh, overstating it, but nevertheless, extremely costly. So at least we can look at the staff cost. Mm -hmm. OK, thanks. Right. Next question by Carlos. It's a long one. Some companies have an aggregated forecast model and they use that to calibrate or to adjust what is generated by individual SKU models. Sometimes this produces a large number of manual adjustments on the SKU statistical forecasts. Do you have any comment about this practice? So I guess the idea is that uh, there's too many adjustments to make and so on. Well, I, I can at least uh, make a quick comment and this relates to uh, uh, Anna's, uh, my doctoral student's work on retailing, where a, a category adjustment will be made as well as a, a local store level adjustment, for example. As to the relative effects on accuracy, um, I await the results basically. But uh, I think they, uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting question. If you take a retailer, uh, it, it has to be done uh, at the aggregate level you know, to take into account, for example, the change in Christmas patterns uh, will be, uh, if you can imagine the adjustments being made in in uh, England or the UK when we come out of lockdown very briefly, you know, how, how would you adjust uh, for 40,000 SKUs? You know, it, it's really very difficult. And one way or another, you're going to have to do generic adjustments, uh, which are potentially modified uh, by classes of store and classes of product. Uh, but we don't have any understanding at all about the uh, results of the, these adjustments, or at least I don't, I don't know whether you do, Mike. 
Yeah, Mike, do you have anything to add? Well, just on the top, if the, if the thinking is way too many adjustments out there being made, another thought, I think this also came from Robert a number of years ago, was um, requiring something that could be implemented in software, requiring reasons behind any adjustment that's being made out there as a way to discourage adjustments, if not, if nothing else, just to annoy the planner enough to, of, of having to enter a reason that it, it keeps them from making kind of frivolous adjustments and forces and maybe it'll encourage to take the ones where they really think are important to make since they've got to go through that extra step. I mean, that's a way of somewhat restricting and limiting it without, you know, forcibly restricting adjustments you can make. Mm -hmm. Good. We have a few other questions. Thanks for this. Uh, Sergei Terehov uh, asks, what about influence on uncertainty of forecast, not just the expected value? I don't know who wants to take this first. I do have a stab at that, um, although it's not related to business forecasting. Uh, the one area I'm aware of some evidence on is in the uh, UK's Bank of England uh, forecasts. Uh, where they produce uh, fan fan charts, they're called, which are essentially uncertainty, uh, pictures of the uncertainty around their forecast. Those are judgmentally uh, defined to a certain extent. Uh, and that, uh, and, and uh, I think that an evaluation of them has shown them to be beneficial. Mm -hmm. So My that, that's a real possibility, a, a new a new area of research. So this is judgmentally adjusting the fan charts? That's right. OK, no. OK, uh, right. Next question by Nikos Kurenzis. Adjusting forecasts or models or both. It is easy to discuss the limitations of the se second. What about the first? So adjusting forecasts or models. Uh, Robert, maybe first. Well, the case study that I've referred to, uh, the company did both. Uh, they, uh, this is the one with the uh, life cycle, uh, where essentially they changed the length of data that they'd use and potentially changed the parameter in the model as well. And then after they've done that, they produced the statistical forecast. Now, it turned out that after those adjustments, the, the forecast was uh, not really very different from Forecast Pro's automatic forecast of the data. Um, there's almost no difference in accuracy. Uh, and then, as I said, they would make a, uh, a judgmental adjustment to their adjusted model based forecast. It, it, the issue gets more complicated when you take a, a something like uh, SAP's FNR system and you will have the same sort of thing, Mike, where essentially You've got a dummy variable which you can uh, one way or another uh, give a value of zero or one to. It's not a well-defined variable. So it, it becomes a bit of a fudge factor. It changes your model to a certain extent. So sometimes the difference between the two is uh, is not very, uh, very clear. However, again, it takes time and, and it requires monitoring. You know, I think that that would be the key conclusion. I think we both draw, wouldn't it, Mike, that uh, doing less of it and monitoring what you do do is a crucial point about getting the best value. Also brings a thought to the recent work by uh, Photios Petropoulos and his colleagues on judgmental role of judgment in model selection and i suppose you could extend an fva to whether your adjustment to the initial model is adding value from the model building perspective mm -hmm. okay uh, good now the next question i'm not uh, sure that i totally understand it maybe you do by errol uh, what is importance of forecast direction accuracy measures for companies if we compare them with the others? Oh, oh yeah, no, I understand it. <laughs> and amazingly, in the analysis, and I haven't yet repeated, I certainly don't have the results at my uh, uh, my fingertips, but something like 30 or so percentage of adjustments are made in the wrong direction. 
uh, which is, I think, so we don't even know from the SNOP process whether the sum of the information which is being shared in that process is positive or negative. It's got a fairly low reliability. So, <coughs> so that is almost the first stage in uh, actually uh, defining a successful FVA uh, process, getting the direction correct. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I think if I recall rightly, uh, Mike, Je one of Jeff's, Jeff Baker's suggestions was exactly focused on direction. Mike, are you still with us? We have uh, difficulties with video. I think uh, technology failed us and Mike was dropped out. Uh, but we still have a couple of questions, so maybe Robert, you can answer them. Uh, Another one by Sven. What the measure of final versus stats forecasts unfortunately ignores is the FVA generated by a human planner, A, choosing a stats model over a prejudgmental forecast, and B, changing the stats model. Uh, some of planners uh, already, some of planners FVA is already embedded in the choice yeah. of stats. How can you extend your studies? Well, yes, I mean, I. Uh, uh, that refers to that story about the life cycle forecast, doesn't it? Where they were changing the uh, stats model uh, to correspond to their understanding of the uh, the life cycle or position of the life cycle of the product. So, yeah, can we extend our studies? Well, not really, because we only have, as I'm aware, one set of data that actually um, delivers the, some of the evidence and think we, we actually would need to have uh, uh, the uh, unmodified statistical forecast, the modified statistical forecast and the final forecast. And that is evidence that none of the studies have. So, mm -hmm. yes, good idea, but it's uh, it's not there. OK, we have a comment and then the last question, a comment by Anna. I think she's replying to your uh, point, Robert. As Robert mentioned, we found that individual SKU adjustments perform better in our data sets in comparison to the group adjustments. So I don't think you need to respond to this. Uh, but the last one, does a combination of category forecasts, e.g. three months and further out, uh, and move to SKU based within the short term, drive uh, sorry drive a better forecast accuracy over the period well i have a response it's not an answer uh, we don't know. <laughs> you know this is why i embarked on this because we actually do know relatively little about this important process uh, it it seems to make sense i think it will be case studies involved in actually examining how people in a in a uh, uh, particular uh, forecasting organization actually do carry out, do they carry out a, a longer term or a medium term three month ahead category study? How does that uh, then in influence them? So we just don't know. Uh, it makes sense to me that that will be a good, a, a better process than uh, some of the ones that we've, uh, we're aware of. But uh, Further research. Academics always ask for further research, uh, but here we've got a very practical problem, uh, which actually does need some practical solutions as well as some theoretical uh, and uh, computer based software solutions as well. OK, thanks, Robert, for answering all the questions. Thanks, Mike, for joining us, although he's not uh, with us anymore. And thank you for participating in the, our Friday forecasting talks. We will have another one in two weeks, which will be delivered by representatives of Forecast Pro. And then we will have a Christmas break and uh, we'll, we will make our plans available starting from well in two weeks time. Anyway, thanks for your time. Thanks thank for you, everybody. Us. Yes, and uh, have a nice send any other queries to me. Yes, as well. Good. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Thanks. Bye.